The articles appear in various newspapers and magazines, as well as on his popular blog, realadamvega.com, and Facebook page, My Inside Stories. He was also the 2015 recipient of the Andy Award for International Journalism from his alma mater, the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The grant supported his reporting mission to Uganda, Rwanda, Africa, in the company of professional world boxer Terrence Crawford of Omaha and Pipeline Worldwide Director Jamie Anouet. Uh, he's the author of several books, including Alexander Payne, His Journey in Film, um, now available in second edition, Crossing Bridges, A Priest Uplifting Life Among, Among the Downtrodden, his latest book, Nebraska Methodist College at 125, Scaling New Heights. Um, I got to ride up with, uh, drive up with him this morning from Omaha, had some great conversations, so I'm looking forward to this. Please put your hands together for, for Leo. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, never been to Wayne State College before, uh, or Wayne, Nebraska. This is, this is good for me. Uh, I, I like what I see. Um, so, as Chad mentioned, um, I'm an author, I'm a journalist, and a blogger, and I, I make my living as a writer, and I have for a long time. Um, and so I'm going to try to give you um, an idea of kind of what it's like to be a, a working writer. Um, and that's the only income I make. It's not much. But uh, um, I've chosen a certain path as an independent freelance writer. And it's not necessarily the best path or the right path, but it's my path. And so um, I wanted to give you a sense for the variety and diversity of the work that I do. And, and it's by choice, mostly by necessity, partly. Um, and so I find that I work best as a writer um, when I'm just going from subject to subject to subject. And they can be very, very different from each other. Um, yet there's a lot of parallels at the same time. Um, so um, Chad mentioned I, I did this book uh, Alexander Payne, his journey in film. It's basically a collection of my journalism about the, the Oscar-winning filmmaker from Omaha. And I go back with Alexander to like 1996, 1997, something like that. And there's a whole story about how I came to him. It had something to do with my having been a film exhibitor um, before I was even a journalist. Um, and then eventually my film buff passion merged with my journalism. And he and I. I came to him as a journalist, he came to me as a subject. Um, and so um, it, it's interesting to be have that kind of association with one subject for the length of time that I, I've had. Um, I just saw his new film, Downsizing, uh, yesterday at a press screening at the Dundee Theater in Omaha. And uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a provocative work, um, you'll, you'll want to see it. Um, if you're a, a film fan at all. Um, uh, I won't say many more about it than that, uh, but uh, definitely seek it out. Um, so I, I began again co covering him. I think I first interviewed him in like 97, I think it was. And, and this, this was the first uh, profile I did of him. So he was much younger then, obviously. <laughs> but, um, he's mid-50s now, and he was in his 30s then. Um, and so basically, the book is, is this collection of, of probably 30 fairly depth pieces about him. Some of these are three or 4,000 word profiles, features. Um, and what I've always been most interested in is his creative process. And so that's, that's the direction I've always go when I report about him, or nearly always go. You're not gonna find out a lot about his personal life in my articles about him. Um, and so you won't find much about his personal life in the book. Um, but you will find out kind of how he thinks about cinema and, and about life to, to a certain extent. Um, and so, yeah, these have all, all these articles have been for local publications. It's basically almost all the writing I do is for the, the local market. Uh, although I've, I've written for statewide Nebraska publications, I've written for the Norfolk Daily News, the Grand Island Independent, North Platte Telegraph, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But mostly Omaha market publications, um, and probably did the most writing about him early on, related to about Schmidt. Just a the whole slew of pieces that I did. Um, 
my favorite time in writing about him um, actually came in that long period when he didn't make a feature film, as you may recall. Uh, there was a long sort of layoff uh, between Sideways and The Descendants. Um, but it wasn't like he wasn't doing anything, he was doing lots of things. Um, but I did get the opportunity to be on the set of Sideways for a week and I was the only journalist there and it's, it's forever spoiled me because I had complete access to everything and everyone uh, for that time. It's not quite been that way since. Um, uh, although I still have uh, a lot of nice access to him. You'll, you'll see the changes in him over the years. Um, and if there were pictures of me, you'd, you'd see the parallel changes in me. Um, and so these mostly have appeared in the Reader, which is an alternative newspaper of long standing, uh, which actually Kevin, right, started. <laughs> um, uh, his, one of his favorite actresses, Laura Dern, who has a cameo in Downsizing, by the way. Um, if you've never seen Alexander Payne's first film, Citizen Ruth, starring Laura Dern, make a point to see it. It's still probably the bravest film he's made, maybe the bravest film he ever made. Um, but yeah, some of the, I think the, the writing I'm most fond of that I've done about Payne came in that interim period, or that period when he wasn't actively making feature films, because he was an, interest, it was an interesting crossroads in his life. And so, for me anyway, those are some of my favorite stories that I've done about him. Um, have you all, have you seen all of Alexander Payne's movies, or, or most of them, or? Yeah. This is probably my favorite cover. It's not of Payne, but. Um, so anyway, this gives you an, an idea of really what the contents of the book are. Um, and there's more than that. Uh, um, and it's an example of how journalism can lead to book projects. Now nobody came to me to write the book, <laughs> and Alexander Payne didn't ask me to write the book. I wanted to archive my, my collection of journalism and make sure it was preserved in a hardbound way. And that was the main motivation for that project. So it's self-published. Uh, I have a new edition out with updated, expanded coverage. Uh, another project um, about a much lesser known individual, but no less interesting, uh, I, st I started reporting about this retired Catholic priest, uh, Ken Vavrina, who had a long association with Mother Teresa. Uh, and that led to him actually commissioning me to write his, to ghost write his autobiography. And so it's interesting how these things happen. And I have a feeling more projects like this will result as, as time goes on. Um, but back to diversity and variety. So I'm all over the place. I write a lot about arts and culture subjects. Um, I write a lot of social justice pieces. Um, I write a fair amount about sports. Um, so this, this was, I think, the lead off piece, or if not the lead off piece, yeah, it was, um, for a series that I wrote on Omaha's black sports legends. We called it Out to Win the Roots of Greatness. And this is Bob Gibson. For some of you who may not, some of you have no idea who that is, I know that. Uh, Hall of Fame uh, baseball pitcher uh, from Omaha, pitched for the St. Louis Cardinals, um, Creighton University graduate. Um, and so I had the privilege of interviewing Gibson and a lot of other legends, Gail Sayers and Johnny Rogers and Bob Boozer and all these guys, Ron Boone, <laughs> and the, the list goes on and on, Marlon Briscoe. And uh, for a long time now, I have had the idea in mind of taking that collection of work and making that a book. So I need to find funding for that. So if you have any ideas about funding, uh, be sure to let me know. Oh, good, all right, we'll talk later. <laughs> um, so uh, diversity, um, there was a period in my life when I wrote a lot um, of Holocaust uh, themed stories. And um, there's a whole story about how that happened and why that happened. And so um, I've probably done 15 to 20 of those articles at, uh, about rescuers, about survivors, about scholars. And uh, this was a piece that I did for the Grand Island Independent. It was actually one of three or four pieces I did on the same subject for different publications. And the, the subject is David Kaufman. And he was a Holocaust rescuer based out of Grand Island. 
And so you might be curious about, well, how is that possible? Well, there's a whole story behind that. You can go to my blog <laughs> and find it, uh, should you desire. Um, but that, you know, those are some of the, some of the more profound interview experiences I've had, naturally. Um, a lot of those pieces were published in the Jewish press in Omaha. Um, and uh, some of those pieces won me some recognition uh, at the local level, the state level, national level. Um, haven't done any of that writing uh, for a while, but um, it, it certainly, I think, helped mature me as a person and as a writer to be sensitive to the subject matter and to, and to try to do it justice. Um, so uh, just continuing with this theme of diversity, So as a generalist, I have to be open to all kinds of subjects. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm actively pursuing things that interest me, and it, it's kind of a, a blessing and a curse because everything interests me. Um, uh, but there's a lot out there. So in no particular order, I'll just kind of give you an idea. This is a, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Dr. Paul Johnsgaard. Um, um, He's a noted uh, professor emeritus uh, at UNL. Um, John Beasley, he's a uh, screen and theater actor. I've written a lot about John um, and actually his sons, um, who are also actors. Um, uh, back to some sports reporting. Um, this was a piece about the then recently um, um, deleted or uh, the demise of the UNO wrestling program. It was one of the top division two wrestling programs in the nation. University decided to, uh, to, uh, to end it. I had close ties to the program because of previous reporting that I did. I followed them for an entire season and traveled with them. And, and uh, so it was kind of a passion piece for me. Uh, and it's kind of calling out the university in a sense um, because I, uh, I and a lot of other people didn't really agree with that decision and see the rationale behind it. But uh, it was really a tribute uh, to Mike Denny, uh, the longtime head coach there, and the program that he had built. Um, and uh, there was a man who preceded him by many years named Don Benning, uh, who recently passed, who is one of the Omaha Black sports legends that I wrote about in that series. You probably never heard of Don Benning. Uh, Don Benning uh, was the first African-American head coach at a predominantly white university in America. And that was at then Omaha University. He was in his late 20s when he got the job. He was also the first full-time faculty member, African-American faculty member at that university. A remarkable man, and he built, he, he's the man who first built the dynasty of, of UNO wrestling. And I, you, you can find on my blog a, a profile I did of him, also, Feature article I did about this remarkable season that culminated in a national championship um, and the incredibly diverse group of young men that he had wrestling with and some of the barriers that, that they had to encounter. Um, this is uh, Carol Rogers, an Omaha native who uh, was away many years touring and she, she's come back to Omaha um, to sing and she comes from a very uh, prominent musical family in Omaha. Uh, there's that, that old geezer again, Bruce Dern as Woody uh, from Alexander Payne's Nebraska. Um, uh, this is uh, Lou Hunter, who is a, uh, a screenwriter, um, a producer, uh, teaches a screenwriting colony in Superior, Nebraska, a longtime UCLA screenwriting instructor, and kind of one of the gurus of screenwriting, the how-tos of it. Um, uh, he's one of my favorite subjects. I've written about him certainly more than once. Um, you probably all recognize this guy. <laughs> I finally caught up with him after you know 30 some years as a journalist. This is in the last two years. Um, uh, I used to write a lot about authors. Those were the days when I could get the reader newspaper to assign me a 4,000 word cover piece on an author. That is not possible <laughs> anymore. Uh, they don't assign that long, and they certainly don't want an author uh, gracing their cover. But anyway, I've written a lot about Ron Hansen, who's one of the, the finest uh, uh, writers that 
Nebraska's produced in the last half century, certainly. And this was the most recent piece that I did on him. And that was in relation to his uh, new novel on Billy the Kid. Another singer, Camille Matoyer Moten, who's kind of an Omaha legend. Uh, this is recently retired head of the Center for Afghanistan Studies at UNO, uh, Tom Gutierrez, who I had written about 20 years before. <laughs> Uh, and that happens when you're around as long as I have been, uh, you often return to subjects, or they return to you. It all seems to work out that way. That, that, that publication, The Reader, uh, I do a lot of their cover stories. I've probably done three or 400 cover stories over 20 years. And so this was on philanthropy. This was on housing discrimination, poverty, faith. Healthcare, the high cost of healthcare, uh, the new Blue Barn Theater, uh, immigration, and, and on and on and on. Um, um, sometimes I travel for my writing, not very often, but, but once in a while it happens. And so um, I had the opportunity to embed myself or accompany a group of Omahans who traveled to Obama's first inauguration. And that resulted in, in this story. And, and you know, that was an interesting, very intense experience uh, with uh, mostly uh, African American uh, a group of individuals. Um, and so got some great stories. It was, it was, a, it was a very good experience. Um, one of my favorite subjects is Hadley Haven. I love Hadley's story. Uh, Hadley uh, became a classical a prominent classical guitarist in the Spanish tradition, at the same time he uh, was a professional rodeo competitor. <laughs> yeah, uh, Vietnam, Vietnam combat vet, uh, has taught for years at UNO. Um, and he was uh, mentored by one of the, the legends of a Spanish classical guitar uh, who adopted him basically as a son and lived with him in Spain. Good story. <laughs> I've written about him more than a few times. Uh, probably recognize this gentleman. Uh -huh. This actually wasn't a, a, a profile so much of Ernie as it was um, a feature article about a political biography written about him by Tekla Ali Johnson. And I happened to know Tekla, and she let me know about the project. So it was a way into Ernie Chambers without it really being <laughs> based on any interviews that I did with Ernie. Um, I've interviewed him a couple times. Uh -huh. uh, Dick Cavett, some of you are probably too young to have any idea who he is, and some of you obviously know who he is. I've interviewed him a number of times over the years. He's one of my favorite subjects. Uh, this is the late Gail Levine. Uh, so this, this was an instance of a subject who became a friend, a personal friend. And uh, Gail was a very fine documentary filmmaker. She often did documentaries about people and projects related to film. And her work appeared on uh, PBS a lot, on American Masters and great performances. And this was in reference to uh, her documentary on James Dean. Uh, some of you may know who this is, and I, I've written extensively about her, uh, Gabrielle <coughs> Union, uh, actress. She's the star of Glee. Thank you, thank you. So I've been interviewing her for like 20 years, 15 years. Um, uh, a mixed martial artist in Omaha, Houston, the assassin Alexander. <laughs> um, let's see, another, another sports story. Uh, this was a Creighton University uh, basketball great, John C. Johnson. This was really a story of uh, the depths that he fell into in his personal life and his attempts to recover. Um, this is a prominent artist. Um, uh, from Nebraska, Bob Weaver, or Robert Weaver. Um, one of the most cantankerous individuals I've ever met in my life. I had been warned beforehand uh, how he could be. He walked out on our interview, which I fully expected, but he came back. Um, he threatened to walk out again, but he stuck around, and we got the interview, and we got the story. Um, Alexander Payne is not the only uh, native Nebraskan who have won an Oscar who lives in Nebraska. There's actually three. You may be surprised. One of them, well, he's not a native Nebraskan, but you can almost count him that as now. Mauro Fiore, 
native of Italy, actually, cinematographer, won the Oscar for Avatar. Ooh. And uh, he married a Nebraska girl on a feature film set of a project being made in Nebraska. And he lived here for many years with his wife, and they raising a family, um, and did a program with Mario at uh, the Coneco uh, in the old market uh, last year. Um, but there's also, so there's Mario Fiore, there's Alexander Pan, there's also a guy named Mike Hill, who's now retired, but he was the co-editor of all of Ron Howard's films for whatever, three decades. Um, so, variety. Um, it, it's it's kind of what keeps the juices flowing. Um, and and, I, and as I said, I like going from one thing to the other. Um, and so, and I, I could, you know, pull out a zillion more examples, but what, what, what's the point, right? <laughs> so, but but I, also, I also do food writing um, uh, as a blogger uh, and, and also, uh, you know, as, as a journalist for uh, an Omaha food magazine called Food and Spirits. I enjoy that very much. Um, and uh, as I say, just kind of in all these different pools of writing. And in order to make a living the way that I'm doing it, I, I have to be in these different pools. And so. Um, the only thing that keeps me going, uh, making this possible financially, is if I have an active book project. Ideally, two or three. And these are not book projects, you know, associated with major publishers or anything like that. These are privately commissioned projects, uh, either between myself and an individual who's hired me to write their bi uh, to write a biography or an autobiography, or between myself and an institution. And so the most recent of those was. Um, uh, one of the projects that, that Chad referenced in his intro, um, um, I think I actually had the title backwards actually down there, uh, Scaling New Heights, Nebraska Methodist College at 125. And so it was their, the history of the college. And I only got that project because they first approached a colleague of mine who passed on it and recommended me. And so I met with all the gurus from the college and they decided, sure, we'll give it to you. And they paid my, my mortgage for 16 months. Um, and you know, because those are, by comparison to what I, is my stock and trade writing for publications like this, which pay very, very little, that was like real money. Um, because an institution is not averse to paying you what is essentially professional services, because that's what we're talking about here. Um, so I, I could talk for 45 minutes just about payment, <laughs> but <laughs> it's too painful. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you don't want to know about that. Uh, but let's just say it's, it's, it's a challenge to make a, a living as a writer. As a writer. I mean, that, that's a given. It's like being an actor. Um, but uh, um, I was telling Chad on the drive uh, up here that uh, a new client of mine who found me via LinkedIn, um, it's a, a new media company that reports on commercial development, commercial real estate development project. And so at first when they approached me, I said, I'm not sure. This, but they're allowing me to write feature stories just as I would for the reader or any of these other publications. And uh, it turns out there's a lot of great subjects, and they're paying me exceedingly well. So that's working out very nicely. Um, so you never know where the work's going to come from. Sometimes it literally comes to you, and those are always godsends, and other times you have to seek it out. Um, it's kind of all over the place uh, in, in that sense. I wanted to read a few things uh, for you, just to get a sense for who I am and how I am as a writer. Just bear with me a second. Oh, I, I, I did mean to, uh, to reference these. So uh, Chad mentioned I, I uh, applied for this uh, international journalism grant from my alma mater, UNO, and, and I was fortunate enough to get it uh, along with a World Herald uh, reporter. And um, I think the World Herald reporter went to Cuba, and I went to Uganda and Rwanda, Africa, uh, in the company of this guy, Terence Crawford. And I'm sure, okay, I'm sure some of you uh, are aware of him by now, uh, since he has multiple world titles to his credit. So I had been covering Terence for some time, and I found out about a trip he had made to those same countries, and he's like, Terence, like, I never heard you mention this before, what's that about? And he, told me a story, and so I, I made it a point to uh, uh, accompany him because I knew he was going again. And so it, it ended up that that happened. And it was a great experience. I mean, for me, 
my first time out, outside the United States. And, uh, um, you know, it gave me uh, an end to his story that nobody else had. And so, you know, as a journalist, you're always a little bit competitive, of course, and you, know, you want to get something that nobody else has. And so it allowed me to do that. Uh, but yeah, I've written several pieces about Terrence. This, this was one about him and a real mentor in his life, Mitch Miner. Um, and I'm still really the only one who's told this story, so I, I, I'm still very proud of this piece, because uh, they have a very close relationship. Um, this is Bud as he was making his climb up. And uh, here's another one. And then the, the pieces that I did uh, related to the, uh, the Africa trip appeared in, in a couple different publications, and this, this was the one that was probably the, the most in-depth. I, I think counting the, the, photo, the photo layout pages and, and the, the content of the story, uh, this is like 12 to 16 pages and additional content online as well. Um, I've been doing this a long time, so um, I'm a little greedy because when I started, I, I was used to getting these three and 4,000 word assignments. And so I became kind of a long form journalism guy in, in Omaha. And then all that went away and I really miss it. <laughs> um, I still get those occasionally. Okay. Just to give you a little sample of what I do how I do it. So this, this was a piece for the reader about what we call the hoops culture. It had to do with a certain recreational basketball league uh, on the north side. Once the hoops get rolling in the Sunday men's recreational basketball league, the scene turns into the kind of urban soul fest you associate with Chicago, Detroit, Philly, or New York. Only this is Omaha. The hold basketball has on urban America is a function of the sport's simplicity and expressiveness. Only a ball and a basket are needed for players to create signature moves on the floor and in the air that separate them, their game and their persona from the pack. Not surprisingly, the hip hop scene grew out of street ball culture, where trash talking equals rap, where a sweet crossover dribble or soaring airborne slam resembles dance and where styling gets you props from the crowd or your crew. Music and hoops go hand in hand. And I had these other selections at my ready, and of course now I buried them <laughs> under the <laughs> other stuff. So bear with me a second. There are a few pieces I, I I specifically wanted to, to read um, because I have a couple nice things that happened this week where I got uh, emails from two separate individuals pertaining to two separate pieces that I did for the reader in the same year, 1996. So, like, what are the odds that you'd hear from someone relatively out of the blue about pieces you did 21 years ago? But that happened. Um, and that's just an indication or that's just an example of how, you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but words can carry power and meaning. And that meaning can, um, can cross over time and distance. And uh, when I got those emails, I mean, I was really affected. Um, um, so if I can find <laughs> the relevant pieces, So the first email was in reference to this story. And this one has seen better days. That is the, the hard copy of it. So this woman, uh, Bertha Calloway, just passed away. And so she was a very prominent uh, citizen of Omaha. She was the founder of what's called the Great Plains Black History Museum. 
and this was the very first cover story I wrote for the reader. So that's like 350 cover stories ago. Um, and at the time, the museum was, was struggling. She was struggling. That struggle actually became much more severe even after the story appeared. And I, I did later report it. Um, we called this uh, Bertha's Battle. These are hard times indeed for the Great Plains Black History Museum and its 71-year-old founder, director, curator, and guardian, Bertha Calloway. The future of the museum at 2213 Lake Street is in doubt unless significant funding can be secured. For months now, it survived on meager admission income, a few small donations and grants, and the limited personal savings of Calloway's family. Added to these difficulties, Cal Calloway's recently experienced personal setbacks and tragedies. In 1993, she underwent brain surgery to remove a benign tumor and then lost her husband of 47 years, James, when he died of a ruptured artery. A grandson was murdered in New Orleans in 1994. She continues under medical care today and sometimes walks with the aid of a cane. One of the cruelest setbacks, though, has been the partial memory loss plaguing her since the operation. As one whose work depends on a steel trap mine, She's keenly frustrated when once indelibly etched names, dates, places, and events elude her just beyond her recall. It wasn't supposed to be this way, not now, not in what should be golden years for her and halcyon days for the museum. She still hasn't lost hope of realizing her perfect dream, a fully funded, staffed, and restored institution free of the financial difficulties that have nagged it over its 20 year history. The rest of the piece goes into more details uh, about the museum and the struggles, but mostly tells her story. It's a pretty remarkable story. Um, um, and this was the piece that the second email referenced. And this was actually the very first feature that I did for the reader. Same year, 1996. And it's a, it's a piece about boxing, kind of. I called it the House of Discipline. There's a dingy little dive called the 308 Bar at 24th and Farnham, whose sodden patrons belly up in pursuit of oblivion. Directly above the bar, a world apart, is an athletic retreat where modern day, where mar modern day Spartans engage in a punishing physical regimen, offering renewal and redemption. The first is a public house of pain, the second a private house of discipline. As dusk falls over downtown on a raw, windy day in February, a short but well-chiseled uniform cop with dark green good looks, Vince Perez, glides with cocksure grace toward the bar, which he bypasses to step inside a glass-fronted entrance next door. A shabby carpeted staircase enclosed by water-stained and paint-peeled walls takes him one flight up to a dim landing poised between empty offices. He follows a hallway to a bare, unvarnished pine door behind which the rhythmic sounds of leather lash discipline reverberate. And so basically it became kind of a, somewhat of an atmospheric piece um, about the men, that is the boxers, and the men who mentor and coach them. And, and um, the guy who sent me the email was one of the boxers, who's now a public defender in San Francisco. And he had recently moved to Omaha uh, attending Creighton University Law School. And he said of all the time he spent in Omaha as a student, his closest associations became those with the fighters and the coaches at what was called the Downtown Boxing Club. Um, and so, it, much to my shock, he said that he still has a copy of the, uh, of the piece and that he still revisit it, revisits the piece often. That's how much it meant to him to have it, I guess, Kind of captured. And the two coaches, the two head coaches at the time, uh, Kenny Wingo and Dutch Gladfelder, I, I, I did a separate profile on them. And I don't think he'd ever seen that piece, so I, I made sure I, I sent him a link to that, because uh, I knew he would enjoy that. Um, the aforementioned Lou Hunter, the, uh, uh, the screenwriter, the producer, the author of a well-known, best-selling, screenplay writing guide. Um, I, I embedded myself uh, in the screenwriting colony for not quite a week. And so this is 
this is a part of what resulted. Uh, and, and Lou is one of those unforgettable characters. Um, twice a year, a fractured, a fractured fairy tale unfolds in the Raspid Republican River Valley. Superior, a prosaic Knuckles County border town of 2055 in the state's most southern reaches, draws dreamers from near and far. They come, some halfway across America, some across the globe, to learn from a professor whose laid-back Socratic method is Aristotle meets Jimmy Buffett. The wise man is screenwriting guru Lou Hunter, a favorite son of Superior, born and raised in nearby Guide Rock, who moved to Superior as a boy. His warm, folksy manner belies his incisive mind and Cosmo experience. In a Will Rogers-esque way, he's an innocent and a sophisticate. His humor part homespun and part sly wink. He's a product of these agricultural back roads that has operated in the garish fast lane of LA as a network television executive, producer, and screenwriter. Gregarious and without self-consciousness, Hunter bears all in front of guests. His surgically repaired knees, bulging midriff, failed first marriage, foibles, successes, philosophies, his name-dropping anecdotes, and fondness for quoting famous writers. He lavishes affection on his two dogs, who casually tell strangers he and wife Pamela both suffer from ADHD. Oh, by the way, we're first cousins, he adds. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Nebraskan, I'm sure none of you have ever heard of, but it's quite a story. Um, his name is Vern Hollebeck, and he became, without anyone knowing it, um, a cultural icon because of the cultural icons his company produced, which were basically t-shirts. He kind of invented the, pre the printed t-shirt industry as we have come to know and made many millions. And then he made many millions more when he got the rights to uh, produce all the printed apparel for Harley Davidson. And he comes from a small family farm in Clarkson, Nebraska. And uh, we've talked off and on for years about doing a book, but a lot of things keep getting in the way of that. But here's just a little bit of this. When Vern Hollaback left his family's homestead near Clarkson, Nebraska in 1961 for the State University in Lincoln, he fully intended on getting an ag agriculture degree, then coming home to help his dad run the place. It's what the eldest son of a traditional Czech farming family was expected to do. But by year two in college, a restless Hollaback embarked on an unimagined path as a hip entrepreneur in the printed apparel field. He was in his 20s when the dreamer in him, he expressed a talent for drawing in high school, merged with the pragmatist. It all began with magic markers and army surplus jackets. Holobeck applied basic designs to white parkas he sold at home Husker football games. Then came t-shirts, what became the core of the company he formed, Holobeck Incorporated. Fraternities snatched him up. His operation evolved from the Alpha Gamma Row Fraternity House basement to the regional festival fair circuit in a downtown Lincoln print shop to a full-scale production plant in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, a Milwaukee bedroom community. Hollebeck Inc. became an industry legend and made him a fortune. Many of his t-shirts are collectibles. Vintage Hollebeck t-shirts have been featured in many films and TV shows, most prominently in that 70s show. His journey from farmland to boardroom took some unusual routes. He did time as a 40-miler, a reference to his early days hand-painting t-shirts at carnivals within a 40-mile radius of home. The allure of the road beckoned him to travel ever farther out. He got his ag degree all right, but opted to make a go of this t-shirt thing with his wife, Terry. The company survived many early struggles. And so on. Uh, he also, um, a little later in his life, became uh, good friends with Larry Hagman, the actor, and Peter Fonda, the actor. And they were part of the same motorcycle club, and they crisscrossed the country on their Harleys. Um, and then um, I've written about Ted Kuzer a few times, and uh, also did a piece on the late William Clefcorn, and on and on and on. Um, I, I, I love writing about writing and writers. I wish I could do that all the time, but such is not reality. <laughs> um, but I, I, I've done enough. Um, 
So this was just one of the pieces on Coozer. Um, late spring in Seward County, we'll find the wild plums Ted Coozer is so fond of in full bloom again. If he has his way, the county's most famous resident will be well ensconced in the quiet solitude he enjoyed. Coozer, whose second term as U.S. Poet Laureate is over at the end of May, will return to the country home he and his wife share just outside the south central village of Garland, Nebraska, tucked away in his beloved Bohemian Elks. It's served him well as a refuge, but as a historical personage now, he's obscure no more, his hideaway not so isolated. It makes him wonder if he can ever go back to just being the old, old duck who carefully observes and writes about the holy ordinary. Um, so that's, this is kind of how it rolls for me, uh, uh, going from subject to subject to subject. In the, in the current issue of The Reader, for example, it, it's a monthly, for most of its life it was a weekly, um, I have the cover story on a young female tech maven, Lashana Dorsey, and it, the story is about busting stereotypes. Um, and part of that is, um, you know, with all the stuff that's coming out about um, sexual harassment that's happened at workplaces and whatnot. Uh, so she, she uh, is, a, is a survivor, uh, let's say, uh, of an ugly incident. And uh, she made a very intentional decision not to remain silent about it, but to go public. And she did it via Facebook about a, a year and a half, maybe after the incident. Um, and, and so in that same issue, I also have a piece on programs in Omaha that are assisting current and incarcerated individuals to re-enter society. And the third piece is on the renovated Dundee Theater in Omaha, which was Alexander Payne's home neighborhood theater um, and where his downsizing is, is, is premiering. Um, so I don't always have three pieces in the same issue, that's a little unusual, but, but again, back to the variety, back to the diversity, that, that is typical. Um, um, and so um, a lot of my life is spent juggling. <laughs> um, and what do I mean by that? It, it's juggling projects. And, and that's just a reality of trying to make a living as a writer. And so it requires organizational skills, which I don't necessarily have naturally. It requires discipline. There's no one looking over my shoulder ever. I, I am completely my own boss. I do have people I'm accountable to. They're called editors <laughs> and publishers. But I work 100% from home. And so the only thing, <clears throat> the only constant um, relationship that I have with them is all by email. Once in a while by phone and almost never in person anymore. I mean, I, I just never have an occasion to meet an editor. Uh, uh, <clears throat> some of you may be surprised to learn, at least this is the way it works in my writing life and with the clients that I contribute to. And besides these publications, Omaha Magazine, Encounter Magazine, B2B Magazine, goes on and on and on. Um, when I turn in a piece, when the, in other words, when the, when the deadline is upon me and I have satisfied myself that this is the completed draft, I turn it in and the next time I see it, it's in print. There, there is no feedback. <laughs> Almost never. Like 95% of the time, 90% of the time at least for sure. And if there is feedback, um, it's you know pretty minimal. But basically, I stopped reading my work like 15 years ago at least because there's nothing I can do. They're gonna do with it what they do. I did the best I could, but I am not in the loop. Once it's turned in, it's theirs. And, and, and the sooner I got over that, <laughs> lamentable fact, the better, because it can really eat you up. Um, and it's not like I'm perfect. I need editors, but it would be nice to have a give and take, a back and forth, and it, and it just routinely does not happen. Um, so um, um, that, that's, that's one of the things to be aware of. Um, I also like to 
And I think it's important to sometimes push myself outside my comfort zone. And I have a very large comfort zone. It's gotten smaller over time. So going to Africa was an example of that. It's like, well, nobody told me to go. I, I, I decided it would be a good thing for me personally and professionally to do it. Um, and I, I, am a, I may be applying for the same journalism grant uh, to take me to the Dominican Republic with a team of Creighton University students. Uh, they have a long-standing program there um, uh, called the Institute for Latin American Concern. Um, and then I've done other kinds of writing just to scare myself, which is also important. And so I've written a play, I've written a memoir, I've written a screenplay, you know, none, none of these will ever see the light of day, thank God. <laughs> but it, it certainly challenges me. And, 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 the, and being scared is a good thing because it, it does something with some adrenaline and I don't know, um, other things. It certainly creatively stirs the juices. Uh, and I'm not a creative writer, I'm not a, I'm not a fiction writer. I, I know I'm not. Um, but, you know, um, the process is pretty much the same looks different um, at the end. Um, and I, I may do that again, because I, I, I'm having that feeling I need to scare myself again. And I'm not sure what that will look like. Going to the Dominican Republic would, would qualify. You know? <laughs> and then sometimes I, I do get published in unlikely places. So I was published in The Black Scholar. Um, so like, you know, Nobel laureates and Pulitzer Prize winners have been published. Why did I get published in the Black Scholar? Well, I wrote a reader cover profile um, on the then head of the Black Studies Department at UNO. And um, he was the founder, co-founder of the Black Scholar. He was in Omaha for just a few years, then he left UNO in Omaha, went back to the West Coast. And he was back with the Black Scholar and he called me up one day and said, can I reprint your profile of me? In the, in the scholar, and I said, uh, yeah, are you sure? <laughs> and, and so there, there it is, there it was. Um, so I, you just never know. I, I've got a piece appearing in the Nebraska Writers Guild new anthology coming out, Voices from the Plains. Um, they asked me to submit something. I submitted one of my pieces of journalism that I thought had a little bit of literary quality and boom. And so they let me know that it's going to be published there. Um, I've been published in Fine Lines Creative Writing Journal. Again, pieces of journalism that I thought were in the literary journalism style, at least, and that you know might fit. Um, and and I, I just think that's important for, for whatever writing you're doing now or whatever writing you intend to do or end up doing is that you always to push yourself a little bit. Because sometimes we're, it's up to us. <laughs> you know, you may not always have someone else in your life to push you, and so it's it's kind of imperative that we're ready to uh, push us push ourselves into corners that make us feel anxious, and then it's uh, turning to our creative faculties and other faculties to get out of that corner and to make the best of it. Um, so I, I I look at writing very different today than I used to. And the most surprising thing to me, and maybe some of you can relate to this, is that when I was a young writer, I really struggled. I mean, not, I wouldn't, I had, I had, mul I had uh, interludes of writer's block, but it was more just, I made everything much more difficult than it needed to be. And so maybe because I've been doing this so long, or maybe because I'm just lazy now, I don't know what it is, but writing comes really, really fast to me. I mean, so it's all the work leading up to writing that is a pain now. It's, it's the interviews, because almost everything I do is primary interview based. And sometimes for the same, for one piece, it might be 15 interviews, or 12 interviews, or 10. Thank God most of them are two or three, sometimes just one. Um, and. Um, and so it's not just that, it's looking up stuff on the internet, doing all those Google searches, and sometimes actually going into actual physical archives once in a while, not very often, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, the, the, you know, I transcribe all my interviews. I record everything. Uh, this is a burden <laughs> that I've given myself that I don't need to have. But I have convinced myself 
that it's important to my process because I do seem to absorb the material by going through the transcribing process itself and it's in me and I just think that it, it gives me an, it makes the material more available to me or in a different way than maybe it would be otherwise or I might just be crazy <laughs> I'm not sure because it's, it's time intensive to say the least um, but yeah it's, it's the process that's the pain it's the writing that's the joy but the writing is like it's just a tiny fraction <laughs> it's everything else that, that is the time suck um, um, but, but what, what, what makes that tolerable is again back to the variety and diversity so it's not like I'm transcribing the same thing over and over and over again or I'm, I'm giving the same kind of interview I mean there is a lot of uh, similarity but there's enough real difference and, uh, and that's really I think what has kept me at this more than anything because it, it makes it seem like and I think it's, it's true that each project or at least every other project um, um, becomes a, a new challenge that you know I want to see if I'm up to. You know, so it's, it's kind of back to that. It's a self-competitive thing. It's, a, it's also I look at other at colleagues' work and I go, oh, okay. Well, let me see if I can <laughs> take a crack at that. And uh, um, but that that's that's kind of what it looks like for me. I, I don't even write every day necessarily because the other stuff that needs to be done may be taking priority. Sometimes I just don't want anything to do with any of it and I take a, actually a day off, oh my God. Um, but, but pretty consistently, steadily, I, I, I'm grinding away at one thing or another and usually um, at different stages of three to five to seven different things. And it's just the way it is. And it's just the way it is. And, and, and some might just be in a corresponding phase, some in a conceptual phase, some in a pitching phase, some in an editorial phase, you know, and on and on. Um, and, and, and that's how it goes. Um, so uh, in lieu of a better offer or idea, this is, this is, uh, this is my life as a writer. So be, I'll be glad to take any questions if we have time or Or if not, we can say, a fond adieu.